stand together and we'll pray and uh, then we'll dive into God's word. Father God, we come before you this morning uh, having already experienced your grace and your goodness. Father, already have he hearing from your, your servants and your word. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for the blessing that was. We pray for blessing on the Rochester family, Lord, on their ministry, on their travels. And uh, Lord, I know that they are busy about your business and growing the kingdom. And we thank you for their efforts in that. And we just ask that you would bless them in a wonderful and mighty way as they continue to do that. Lord, bless us now as we dive into the book of Romans and what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 8. Last week we took some time to um, kind of introduce this new series called Created for Significance. And we, we talked about the reality last week that, that we all need to be reminded of continually, and that is that God has designed us for significance. It doesn't always feel like our design is one of significance, but it is. It is a significant design, and we are designed on purpose for significance. Each and every one of you have been intrinsically and intimately designed by the creator of the universe for significance. If you missed that message, we would encourage you to go and check it out uh, on YouTube, on uh, our Facebook page, on our Cowboy Church website page, all that stuff. It's free. I would encourage you to go watch it because today we're going to kind of build on that just a little bit as we, we talk about how God takes his design and then he destines it for significance. You're not just designed for significance, you are destined for significance. But if your life is anything like mine, which it probably is in some way or another, you probably don't always wake up in the morning feel like, feeling like you're destined for significance, do you? Or you probably don't always go to bed at night after a long day and think, man, I'm, I'm destined for significance. It's not always the first thing on your mind as you're walking through life because life is full of struggle, isn't it? Life can be chaotic and full of chaos at times. The process of, of dealing with hardships can take our mindset off of the significance that we have been designed and destined for. And let, let's face it, sometimes life just feels very mundane. It feels, it feels very meaningless. We, we get to the end of the day or the end of the week or sometimes even the end of the year and we kind of go, why did that even matter? What did I even do? Sure didn't feel significant. Or maybe it's the part of life that has you dealing with insecurities or anxiety or stress or one complexity and complication after another, after another, after another. Whatever it is, there's a lot of things in our lives that can make us feel like we're not destined for significance. And I'll tell you where that comes from right here at the front. We have an enemy, the devil, and the devil wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Amen? He wants to kill, steal, and destroy you. And one of the ways he does that is he, he fills your life up with all these other things that takes your mindset off of, hey, I'm designed for significance, and I am destined for for significance. He, he doesn't want you to remember that your destiny in Christ is a significant destiny. He wants you to forget about the destiny that has been promised to you by the provision of the gospel. And we're not the only ones to feel this way. In Romans chapter 8, I've, I've often said if I could preach through one chapter of the Bible from like verse 1 of that chapter through the end, I, I would love to just preach through Romans chapter 8. Uh, I think it would take me 8 to 10 hours to do it, but it would be a great preaching marathon. And maybe, maybe I'll launch off into that one day, but not today. But I do want to start with verse 1 today because I want you to get some context for what Paul says here. Listen to how this chapter begins in Romans chapter 8. He says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Can we get an amen for that? Praise God. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free 
from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do, since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. That, to me, sounds pretty significant. We're going to skip over a bunch of other good and significant stuff and jump ahead to verse 31 in Romans chapter 8, where we find our text for today. Romans 8, 31 through 39, and listen to what it says. It says, what then are we to say about these things? The apostle here is writing to a group of people who, just like you and just like me, had perhaps forgotten that they were destined for significance, and he is reminding them of that. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you, we're being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded... That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Paul is reminding these believers that you are destined for significance. And in this text, he asked seven questions. Seven questions that are all aimed at reminding the believer, getting them to think through whether or not they're destined for significance. Seven questions that are reminding them that they have a significant destiny because of the blood of Jesus. Seven questions that all remind them that their destiny is secure. That's our big idea for today, that a secure destiny is a significant destiny. You can't have a significant destiny unless it's a secure destiny. A secure destiny is a significant destiny. There are three things I want you to see from this text. Certainly there's about 40 we could talk about, but we're just going to do three today. First, I want you to see what I call the problems. The apostle does a brilliant job here talking about the problems of life. In this text, there's a series of problems that are presented. And, and these problems are not outlined in an effort by the Apostle Paul to be an exhaustive list. He's not saying these are all the problems you'll ever have in life. He's not even saying these are the biggest problems you'll have in life. This is not Paul's comprehensive list of any kind. He's not putting them in order of significance here or anything like that. He's just kind of generally offering a summary of the possible problems that people tend to run into. And that being said, the Apostle Paul very accurately delivers a list of problems that all fall into one of two categories. And I may be oversimplifying things here today, but I really don't think so. I mean, I put a good bit of thought into it. I put a good bit of prayer into it. And I looked at Paul's list, and then I started making my own list of problems. And I found that every problem on my list that I could list also fit into one of these two categories that Paul lists here. The more I thought about it, the more I prayed about it, the more I added to my list, the more I looked at my list, the more I considered all of my problems that I've ever experienced, the more I realized they all fall into one of two categories. The first one is this, and you might write these down. We didn't put them in your bullets, and we probably should have, but the first one is this, people. Yeah, people. Now, now, please hear me, don't, and don't misunderstand me. I love people. I love my family. I love my friends. I love the people that make up this church. I love you guys. I, I love my neighbors. I love people. But many of the problems in my life 
are a result of my relationships with other people. How many of y'all have problems because of other people? Everybody, right? People are problematic. People cause problems in our lives. And Paul's questions here, many of them begin with the word who. Who? What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? He did not spare, verse 32, his own son, but gave him up for us all. How can he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Again, he asks, who can separate us from the love of Christ? The reality is there are many people who are against us. And there are many people who were against Paul. There are many people who will accuse you. And many who accused him. There, there are many who will attempt to condemn you and many who attempted to condemn him. There are many who will attempt to and desire to distract you from your calling in Christ. And many who did the same to him. There are many who would love to demoralize you. There, there are many who would love to do everything they can to dissuade you from your calling in Christ. There are many who cause problems in life. Many people. David had problems with people. That's why he cried out in places like Psalms 27, 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom or who should I fear? Who should I be afraid of? He had a lot of people causing him trouble. He goes on and says, The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Who should I dread? Many of David's problems were caused by people. Now, some of David's problems were caused by himself. But many of them were caused by other people. Paul doesn't list a lot of people who caused him problems by name, but he does list some. One is in 2 Timothy 4, 14 through 15. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did great harm to me. He goes on and says, the Lord will repay him according to his works. And then he gives a warning. He says, watch out for him yourself because he strongly opposed our words. In other words, he's going to want to hurt you too. In 2 Corinthians, we see people written all over many of the problems that Paul recounts here in his life. Again, in kind of a summary way, a summary statement. 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 28, he says, Are they servants of Christ? Am I talking like a madman? I'm a better one with far more labors, many more imprisonments, far worse beatings, many times near death. He says, five times I received 40 lashes. I'm sure people did that. Minus one from the Jews. They are people, Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. I'm sure people were holding them. Once I received a stoning. Probably came at the hands of people, wouldn't you think? Three times I was shipwrecked. That may or may not have been the cause of people, but there were other people involved in some of those decisions that led to that. I've spent a night and day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I face dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers. Those are people. Dangers from my own people, he says. Dangers from Gentiles. Those are all people. Dangers in the city. Guess what cities are filled with? People. Dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, and dangers among false brothers. People. Toil and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold, and without clothing, not to mention other things, there is the daily pressure on me and my concern for all the churches that's made up of, guess what? People. I mean, if we had time, we could look at more scriptures, but Paul certainly had problems with people. If we had time, we could look at the life of Jesus. Jesus had problems with people. We could look at the problems the Pharisees had with Jesus. We could look at the problems the Sadducees caused for Jesus. We could look at the rulers and authorities who prompted and prodded and persecuted Jesus all the way through it. Even the disciples caused Jesus problems, amen? The bottom line is, if, if, if there are people in your life, guess what you're going to have? 
problems. People will cause problems. And when your life fills up with problems that are caused by people, even if you love those people, very quickly you can forget that you were created for significance and that, that God has, a, has destined you for significance. There's a second category of things that can fill up your list of problems. And if you make a list of all your problems, you'll see, just like I did, that it either involves people or this second category, which is predicaments. You might call them circumstances. How many of you ever found yourself in a predicament? Anybody else? Yeah. Now, predicaments can be caused by people. Predicaments can be caused by us. We can put ourselves in predicaments. But sometimes predicaments are just a part of life, just a part of living in a sinful world. But no matter what they are, predicaments oftentimes are problems that we have to deal with. And predicaments are oftentimes things that will distract us and cause us to forget that we're created for significance. The final part of this text is outlining these problems caused by these predicaments that can come up. And again, not an exhaustive list here. Look with me, starting in verse 35 of Romans 8. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, because of you were being put to death all day long, were counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, he says, these predicaments, these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, here come some more predicaments, neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So Paul concludes that neither people nor predicaments possess the power to preclude him from attaining the significant destiny the gospel has provided for him. A secure destiny is a significant destiny, and Paul says, my destiny is secure. People can't take it away from me. Predicaments can't strip it away from me. The problems that come up in my life have no bearing on the destiny that has been provided to me from the gospel. He was able to keep his mind focused on that, and that's my encouragement to you today, is no matter what problems you have in your life, and whether they're caused by people or predicaments, whatever they are, don't let that take your focus off of the destiny that God has for you through Christ. Don't let those problems decrease or diminish the security that you have because of the gospel. Because when we don't feel secure, that's when we start going crazy. And when we don't feel secure, that's when we lose sight of what our destiny really is. I mean, that's what happens, right? Our problems get bigger and bigger, whether they're caused by people or predicaments. Sometimes we make our problems bigger than they even are. Y'all have never done it, I know. Y'all are like, I've never done that. It's just only you, preacher. But sometimes we make our problems bigger than they really are. And they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the bigger they get, the harder it is for us to stay focused on eternity. And the significant destiny God has for our life. It's hard to be focused on the significant destiny God has for your life when your bank account is completely empty. It, it, it's hard when you walk out there and you stand on the top of the tank dam and you look down into a dry hole and there's not a cloud in the sky and there's no rain in the forecast, it, it's hard to stay focused on eternity in that moment. Or when, when you go out there to feed the cows and you get the last bale of hay out of the hay trap and you haul it out to them and they're mooing and they're cold and they're hungry and they're counting on you. And not only are you out of hay, you're out of money, and there's a lot of winter left. It's hard right there to stay focused on eternity and the destiny that the gospel provides for you. It's tough when your marriage is falling apart, when you're just barely hanging on, when everything feels like it's collapsing around you. It's tough in that moment to go, you know what, I'm destined for significance. It's hard when you lose your job and you go, you go get in your car to drive home after being let go and you know you got a wife and kids 
or a husband and kids at home that are counting on that, it's hard right then to go, you know what, I'm destined for significance. It's tough when you've got a couple of teenagers in your house making all your hair fall out, <laughs> driving you nuts to go, you know what, look at all this, I'm destined for significance. It's tough, right? Problems will distract you from your significance, and that's what Paul is saying here, don't let these people or these predicaments that produce problems in your life make you feel insecure so that you forget about the destiny you have because of the gospel and because of Jesus and the work on the cross. A secure destiny is a significant destiny. There's two more things we see in this text. The next one I call the prerequisite. Everybody should know what a prerequisite is. Something you got to have before you get the next thing, right? Or can do the next thing. And I want everybody to hear what I'm about to say. If you don't hear anything else I say today, I want you to hear this. Because this might be the most important thing you ever hear anybody say in your entire life. I want you to hear this. Everyone has a significant destiny. But not everyone has the same destiny. Everyone has, everybody, everybody in this room, everybody you know, everybody who can hear this on the radio, everybody has a significant destiny, but not everyone has the same destiny. Some will go to heaven. That's significant. Some will go to hell. That's significant, but they are not the same. Heaven and hell are not the same. Both are significant. Both are destinies that... You'll go to one or the other, but they are not the same. And it would be easy for us just to walk away from this text. It, it would be easy for us just to walk out of here this morning and say, you know what, Paul just wants us to feel good about our destiny. I'm not going to let the predicaments and the people of life and the problems that come from them distract me from my destiny. But that would not be a complete picture here of what the text is saying is needed. Paul doesn't want you just to feel good about your destiny. He wants you to be certain of it. He wants you to be sure of it, and he wants you to be secure in it. And that's why he outlines this prerequisite throughout this text. Romans 8, 31, what then are we to say about these things? And then he says, if God. If God is for us, who is against us? That's the prerequisite, if God is for us. Or Romans 8, 37 through 39, knowing all these things, we're more than conquerors, not because of who we are, not because of what we have. He says we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. That's the prerequisite, Christ. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor present things, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's the prerequisite, Jesus. You see, there is no significance or security in your destiny if Jesus is not in your life. If you have not been saved, if you have not been forgiven, if you have not repented of your sins, called and confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you have not been redeemed, if you have not been radically transformed from death to life by the blood of the Lamb, then your destiny is hell. And you think people and predicaments are problematic? Just wait until you're dealing with demons and the devil for the rest of eternity. You see, Jesus is the prerequisite for a safe, secure destiny. Now, you can believe me on this and trust me on this because I'm telling you the truth, but I don't just want you to take my word for it. I'm going to give you four scriptures out of many I could share, but I'm going to give you four scriptures because I want you to hear this from the mouth of God. John 14, 6 and 7, Jesus told him, these are the words of Jesus. I am, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. I am the prerequisite. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my Father. I'm the prerequisite. If you know me, then you will also know my Father. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him, he said. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, just one of many more examples we could share, says this, there is salvation in no one else because he's the prerequisite. You got to have him. For there is no other name, the prerequisite, no other name, no one else, Salvation in no one else, no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, just one. And he's the prerequisite. And he names him. One God and one mediator between God and mankind. He says, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. John 3, 36, if there's still any doubt in your heart or mind, the one who believes in the Son has eternal life because he's the prerequisite. But the one who rejects the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. There is no salvation outside of Jesus. He's the prerequisite for it. Everyone has a destiny, but not everyone has the same destiny. And a secure destiny is a significant destiny, and Jesus is the only way to get a secure destiny. He's the only way to find a secure destiny. He's the prerequisite for it all. Now let me close with this last point. It's the promise in this text. There is a promise contained in this passage. And before we get to what the promise is, can I just tell you what the promise is not? The promise of the gospel, the promise of this passage, the promise of the biblical Jesus is not you will be rich if you follow me. Some of y'all done figured that part out. The promise is not if you follow me and become my disciple, you'll never be sick. You'll never get the flu. You never have to get an immunization. You never have to worry. Because if you follow me, you'll be healthy your whole life. That's not the promise. The promise is not you will never have problems if you come and follow me. The promise is not your marriage is going to be perfect if you follow me. Had a guy, he, the, his family, they left our church some time ago. Not, not mad or bad or anything like that. They just moved out of state for work. And we've stayed in touch over the years through Facebook mostly, through Messenger and holidays and whatnot. And he reached out to me a while back and having some marriage issues and problems and just wanted some help, wanted to talk things through. And as we started talking about it, he, he says to me, he says, you know, I just thought if I follow, when I was following Jesus, like everything in my marriage would be great. We were reading the Bible together and going to church together and, you know, like, isn't isn't this supposed to be easy? And I said, man, who lied to you and told you that? (laughs) Marriage is like the biggest problem you'll ever have in your life if you want to get married. You want to know why? It's filled up with people and and predicaments. Married people know what I'm talking about. You, you got people in your life you cannot get away from. You can't give them back to the hospital. You can't just like say, hey, I, you know, <laughs> got this from here about eight years ago. Please take it back. <laughs> These people are with you forever. It's till death do you part. <laughs> and there's predicaments when you do that much life with that many people. It's going to be hard. The promise is not your marriage is going to be easy. The promise is not your kids are going to obey you and honor you. The promise is not you're going to live to be 120 years old, and when you turn 120, you're going to still look and feel like you're 25. There are people who preach this nonsense, but that's not the promise. The problem, I mean, the promise is not that your problems all go away. The promise is not that your problems are all solved. The promise is not that you're going to have even fewer problems. The reality is anybody with people and predicaments in their life is going to have problems. Here's the promise, though. Look at verse 37. 
He says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors in all these things. Not that all these problems go away, but even in these problems, even in these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us. Here's the promise. Will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, if you have the prerequisite and you have Jesus and you're following him, the promise isn't that everything's going to be good. The promise is even when everything's bad, he's still good. Even when everything's falling apart, he's still put together. Even when everything's falling apart, he still loves you and cares about you, and you have a secure, safe destiny because of the gospel. You see, the promise is that despite your problems in your life, you're going to be able to walk through those and not lose sight of the fact that God has created you for significance and destined you for it. Your destiny is significant and it is secure if you're following Jesus. A secure destiny is a significant destiny, and there is no more secure destiny in all the world than to be saved by the blood of the Lamb. To be adopted into the family of God. To have your name written in permanent ink in the Lamb's book of life. To have the Holy Spirit come and indwell you. To live inside of you. It doesn't get any more secure than that, my friends. That, my friends, is the promise. And the secure destiny that you're promised and created for. And it's a significant destiny that we cannot lose sight of. You are designed for significance. And if you're saved, you are destined for significance. And nothing can change that. So no matter what your problems are, don't forget that. Walk in it. Believe it. Remind yourself of it. Because it's true. And if you're not saved, If you don't know Jesus, if you've never called on him, if you don't have the prerequisite to eternal life, which is Christ, we invite you to do that this very hour in this very place. Right now, right here, and right away. You don't leave this place without repenting of your sins and confessing that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. The prerequisite is free. All you've got to do is realize you need it and call out for it. And the Bible says you'll be saved. Repent and believe this hour. And feel the incredible feeling of having a secure, eternal destiny locked up forever. There's only one way. His name is Jesus. Let's pray. If that's you, we don't ask you to walk to the front, meet us at the back. I'm not going to ask you to raise a hand or stand up. I'm not going to ask you to utter a word out loud or meet me in some creepy room when this is over. If that's you and you need Jesus, you just pray right there where you are right now. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up. I know that I don't have you in my life right now and so Lord by faith I just pray that you would forgive me by faith I ask that you would cleanse me and change me and make me new Lord I thank you for your grace and your goodness I thank you for adopting me into your family I thank you for designing me for significance and giving me a destiny of significance. Help me to embrace that and learn more about it every day from here forward. Father, as we close this hour, we thank you for those who've just done that for the first time. And Lord, for those of us who've done it long ago, Father, help remind us of the significance of it. It wasn't just another prayer. It wasn't just another day. It wasn't just another time we went to church. It was the day you called our name. It was the day 
the angels rejoiced in heaven. It was the day you wrote our name down in the book, the only book that matters. Lord, help us to remember and recall the significance of it and to hold our heads high even with the problems of life and whatever we're walking into this week, to hold our heads high remembering that you have created us, designed us, and destined us for significance. Lord, help us to live like that this week as a testimony to a lost and dying world that we will certainly encounter. Lord, we ask this and we pray this in Jesus' name.